Thank you. Hi, hi guys. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's very nice that we're 50-50 gender. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, I remember I came here many years ago to give a talk and I was the only woman in the audience. So it's nice to see. Statistics on five people. Yeah. Are easy. <laughs> so I'm happy. Okay, so uh, oh, my statistics. Is oh crazy. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, thanks for coming. And uh, I will talk uh, about uh, efficient uh, verification of computation. And I don't really know the background of all of you, so uh, just ask questions, okay? So we'll make, we'll make sure we're on the same page. And I have no agenda to finish, or I just mainly want to kind of show you kind of things that I feel like is exciting going on in cryptography. Okay, so uh, the motivation for this talk is that, you know, the way we are doing computing has really been changing over the last decade. Uh, so, you know, we used to do uh, computation kind of on our own local devices, and this actually has been shifted quite a bit in the last decade or so. And now a lot of our computation or uh, data is stored actually and done on remote and often untrusted platforms. And this is for various reasons. One is because uh, we often use very computationally limited devices such as iPhones or smartphones and so on that cannot do heavy computations. And also because of the abundance of, of data that we cannot store locally. And so we often store these data as either in some cloud platform that stores our data. Uh, today, there's more and more kind of uh, uh, a use of, of blockchain technology. Now there's like huge public ledgers that store our data. And a lot of our transactions, you know, we need, whether it's payments or a, a, a other things are all now, we need to verify that they're done correctly on, on these, you know, untrusted pub public ledgers. So this kind of reality brings challenges. And like just to name a few, you know, one challenge that we need to deal with is economics, right? How do we know, uh, how do we incentivize people to use, you know, uh, our, our medium in the right way? So incentivizing, pricing, that kind of stuff, things. Very outside of my area of expertise. Uh, the other one is has to do with privacy. So, and that's very dear to my heart. I'm a cryptographer. So I, you know, a lot of my research on privacy. And then the question is, how do we ensure the privacy of our information when it's stored publicly? For example, in a public ledger, when we do pay, when we make some payment, how do we know maybe we want to keep you know, the payment when we pay to the amount private? And how, how do we do that? So even though this topic is very dear to my heart, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today has to do with integrity. Integrity meaning when we give an untrusted platform, we ask them to do some computation for us, how do we know that the computation they've been doing is correct? For example, with uh, uh, kind of digital payments, when you give me some payment, how do I know that it's valid? You know, you give me some, how do I know I need to, to, to verify validity? I need to kind of verify it with respect to the entire blockchain. I don't store the blockchain, this ledger, so how do I know things are correct? Okay, so that's the question that I'm gonna be focused on today in this talk. How do we verify integrity of computation? So let me just try to formalize this problem. So what is the goal? The goal is I have some computation. Think of it as a tree machine, a circuit, whatever model of computation easiest for you to think about. And I have some input. Now I want my cloud service, whatever my prover, whoever is doing the computation for me, I want them to do, do the computation, compute the output, why? But in addition, I also want them to provide for me a succinct certificate that certifies the correctness. That when I see the certificate, I, I know that the output is indeed Y. And what's really crucial is that first, the certificate should be uh, succinct, it should be efficient to verify, and of course, should be hard to think. Okay, so let me say all of this a little more precisely. So, uh, more formally, we require two requirements. First called completeness and the other one called size. Completeness just means that if indeed this computation is correct, if it's a true machine, usually we say if indeed the output is Y within a certain time, so we have some time on T, 
And then we want to say you can generate a valid certificate for this output. In time, not much more than T. So not much more, don't want to define it formally. It can be polynomial in T, it can be linear. In t, but we don't want to run also an exponential in t. So we don't want a huge overhead. So you know, so the prover, the cloud provider, you know, will be able to do that, you know, in reality. And of course, we want that the size of the certificate and the time to verify it should be much, much smaller than t. And that, of course, is really paramount because if you need time t to verify, we'll do it all. We started with the fact that we're weak devices, we don't have time or do wish. To run in time t. So this is kind of the most crucial that I get something succinct and I can verify it very efficiently, much more efficient than it takes to do the computation. Okay. So this is uh, a, the first a, a property. So we're talking about how to verify computation. So I just started kind of uh, the goal is we have an out, we have some computation, we have an output, and we want a succinct certificate that certifies the correctness of the output. Okay, so the other thing we want, the other property is soundness, which means you can't fake it. Okay, so you can't generate a certificate for a wrong thing. So we want to say if y is the, the incorrect, is not the correct answer, then it should be pract practically impossible to generate a certificate. Okay. Now, what do I mean by practically impossible? Essentially, what I mean is, well, maybe you can, but if the only way you can do that, if an adversary, some cheating prover, succeeds in cheating and faking it, that he, he, the only way he can do this is by breaking some really hard problems, some cryptographic assumption. For example, the hardness of factory, that's one kind of famous cryptographic problem. Okay, so unless you cannot factor large number or break one of our other favorite cryptographic assumptions, then you should not be able to, uh, to fake a certificate. Questions? Okay, so let me actually ask a question for you, which is, why not just say impossible? Well, why am I saying, oh, it's practically impossible. Like, actually, the only way you can do it is by breaking assumption. Why not just say, you know, if it's the wrong answer, it's impossible to generate a, a certificate. Like, you know, there are no fake certificates. So, of course, I wish I could say that, but we believe that's actually too strong. We can't say that. And for this, you know, the people who are like experts in complexity, theory, let me just say intuitively what, the reason why we cannot hope to just say it's impossible, because if you could, it means that any time t computation, deterministic time t computation, you have like a succinct witness for it. So it means it's like a non-deterministic time much, much smaller than t. And we believe that this is false. Nobody, this is true. So the point I want to make is the reason we say practically impossible, not just outright impossible, is because we don't believe we can get it. Okay, so it's a relaxation. Okay, so this soundness condition is called computational soundness. We would like to say, oh, statistically, it's impossible, but we cannot. So we say computational soundness. Okay, and by the way, I just want to mention one thing here, kind of as a to give you a sense of what cryptography is about. You know, cryptography is kind of nothing is possible. If you try to do everything, kind of define it in ideal form, you'll run into walls left and right. So, and nothing is possible. In order to do things, you always need to relax the models. So even though this question has, in some sense, nothing to do with cryptography, because it's not about hiding, it's just about integrity. On the face of it, it's not cryptographic. We don't think of it as a cryptographic question. The way we overcome this impossibility is using cryptographic techniques. And it's kind of the cryptographic thinking that allows us to, to get this kind of object. Okay, so we, we, so we have the standard completeness and then computational soundness. Any, any questions about, about the properties that I want that I'm gonna achieve? Okay, please, please stop me with any questions. Okay, questions are fantastic. Um, okay, so another thing that we allow, and again, this is necessary, is we assume that both the prover who, are, who is generating this proof for us, or the cloud provider who is generating the proof, and the verifying, the weak device that is verifying this proof, they kind of share some randomness. They know there's some shared randomness in the sky. Everybody knows it. There's some randomness that everybody shares. And I don't want to go into exactly why this is needed. With The point is, if we don't have this, we're kind of stuck again. There's nowhere, no way. That we, don't, we don't have any place to embed our cryptographic assumptions. And then we kind of 
we're back to kind of the information theoretic setting. We can't get computational sounds without CRS. This is still by CRS, common random Is that a formal way in which this is known? Yeah, it's formal. Yeah, I can actually, we can prove that actually you cannot, uh, uh, without the CRS, it's impossible because without a CRS, essentially, there's a way to reduce it to this statement and then it's impossible. Yes, yeah, so this is formal. Okay. And uh, I just want to point out one thing you can ask is like, okay, what? This seems weird, like what an odd model. Well, let's talk in the sky, is there any CRS? There no, so what is this CRS? And I just wanna say in, so in theory, we just assume there's a CRS, blah, 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 because we're in theory land and we can play around. In practice, actually these things are used. And often this CRS is kind of like the, a, is what we'll see today, for example, and that's often the case. The CRS is like a seed for some hash function. It's like a description of a hash function. And in real world, they just use these off the shelf hash functions. I'll, I'll get into that and I'll explain, but, these things are actually used in the CRS, usually some practical thing, uh, some description of a certain hash function, uh, like SHA-256, they have all these standardization, that's what's used. But in theory, we think of it as like a random string. And I'll explain more about this. Okay, so this object is called a succinct, non-interactive argument. It's succinct, the point is that this certificate is like, it's not an interactive thing, it's just a certificate. And argument is just a, another, it's a, it's like a computationally sound proof. So it's like, a, you know, we can't say it's a proof because that's a strong statement. So the computational sound, so argument is how we call computationally sound proof. So we call it SNARG for short. By the way, I have, who here heard the, just the word SNARG? Okay, um, half, yeah, okay. Um, so this is what I'm gonna show you today, how to construct these SNARGs. Uh, okay, so what do we know about these constructions? So the first to actually propose this is done with the work from a work by uh, Mikali who was kind of motivated by work by Kilian uh, in the 90s. They gave the first SNARG heuristic. The reason I'm saying heuristic is because they didn't quite have a proof of security. So they couldn't really prove soundness under standard assumptions. They actually proved it in kind of this ideal model. I don't want to get into it. So there was no real proof of security. And there was some security issues that I'll talk about when, when uh, we'll, uh, as we go along. After that, there were a lot of, you know, stream of results. I'm gonna mention some of these as well. Uh, it was a very rocky road, okay? But actually, only very recently, like in the last couple of years, we actually can show a SNARG that we can actually argue that it's provably secure under some standard cryptographic assumptions. And that's what the plan for today. So what do I mean by provable secure under assumption? What we show is you assuming you believe the assumption. So assuming factoring is hard or another assumption that we really like in cryptography these days is called the LWE, it's called learning with air. Uh, we really like this assumption because it's one of the few assumptions that's known to, that is believed to be post quantum secure. All are kind of more uh, the, uh, the earlier assumptions like factoring or discrete log are all known to be broken using quantum computers. So we're kind of hesitant uh, as, you know, as quantum computers are becoming a reality maybe. Uh, so now we like the learning with error assumption. So the point is what, what you want to say is that if there exists an adversary that managed to generate a snark for a false statement, the succinct certificate, then actually I can use it to factor large numbers, to break the LW assumption. And then we're kind of at least, if you believe that that assumption is true, you can rest assured that, you know, nobody will be able to fix certificates. Okay, then, so that's what we mean by provable security in cryptography. Okay, so when we say it's secure, we don't actually have a real proof. It's like a reduction to an assumption. And that is the goal. Okay, as opposed to a heuristic where I propose a method, but Nobody knows if it can be broken or not. Like there's no kind of argument why, you know, it's it's out. Questions? No. Okay. So <clears throat> my my goal is to try to show you this uh, a how to give you a high level idea of how to construct the snark. But to do that, uh, let me first spend like a slide or two showing you the relevant kind of prior work and actually most beautiful work really, uh, so it's a kind of a treat, and a kind of evolution of proofs in computer science. And we'll use this evolution to construct our snags, okay? And this evolution of proofs was kind of motivated 
by the, the goal of constructing what's called zero knowledge proofs. So I actually don't want to really explain what zero knowledge proof. These are proofs that kind of reveal no information. So it's in the regime of secrecy, which again, is not at all the focus of the talk. We only care about integrity here, uh, but motivated by actually constructing proofs that reveal no information, like you don't learn anything about why this thing is true, just the fact that the thing is true. That was the goal. And this goal kind of, it was shown that it's impossible to do using kind of classical proofs and it motivated kind of different models of proofs. So that's kind of the evolution and I, I'll kind of show you what, what, what this is. Okay. So proofs were studying, were studying in mathematics in the last, you know, thousands of years already in early Greece, uh, you know, was studied and there's, uh, you know, you can axiomatize it and Hilbert studied started this large kind of uh, uh, study of proof complexity. There's a subfield in mathematics and so on and so forth. So proofs were studied for thousands of years. And what is a proof? A proof when, you know, you ask any mathematician, what is a proof? They'll say, oh, it's, you know, a bunch of axioms and logical deductions, you know, and you just go in the room and verify it. Okay. Now, with the goal of constructing zero knowledge proofs, it was noticed that actually it's impossible. You can't use this model to construct a zero knowledge proof. Because a proof is something that you reveal nothing, nothing. And I have a piece of paper with kind of axioms. It, this is information. Like I can give it to someone else, I can sell it, I can. So it's not nothing. It's not like I didn't look, get, gain anything from the proof. I gained this piece of paper. So they noticed, oh, they wanted zero knowledge and they can't really get zero knowledge. So again, kind of going back to, you know, cryptography being an art of kind of overcoming impossibilities, what did they do? They decided to change the model. Okay, so uh, yeah, I just, I forgot to say, but you know, these classical proofs already in the seventies were, were defined in, in by a, a computer scientists in the early seventies. Kind of, and that's the definition of the class NP is the language, is the class of all language that have efficiently verifiable proofs. And in computer science, efficiently verifiable in poly, poly size, poly time, that's our definition of kind of efficiency. Okay, going back to, to the uh, goal of zero knowledge. So there's a, a work of Goldas, Mikali, and Rako for which uh, a, a uh, Shafi and Silvio, one of the big contributors, for which they kind of, one of the big reasons they won their Turing Award is to get zero knowledge proofs. And to get that, what they did is they changed the model of a proof. So before, where a proof was just kind of a piece of paper with kind of logical deductions, now a proof is interactive. It's actually an interactive thing between a verifier and a prover. And the, so the proof, the verifier is still called one real time, like he's efficient. Uh, but now, the verifier is allowed to toss coins and we allow a very, very small probability of error. So think about, you know, there is a probability, I don't know, two to the minus a thousand that you'll be convinced of a false statement, but that's smaller than the number of elements in the universe, so who cares? Okay, so that's the new model. And they managed to do zero knowledge in this model, which again, zero knowledge is not the point of this talk, but what's really interesting even though this definition was modeled so that we'll be able to hide information and so on, what was noticed soon after it was defined that it's very powerful. So whereas with just classical proofs, you can prove what's called the class NP. With interactive proofs, IP, you can prove any language in P space. P space is much more powerful. It's any language that has kind of uh, can be computed via like a machine that has polynomial space, but can have exponential time. So it's much, much more. So this is a very powerful model. And intuitively, the reason it's so powerful is, let me just give you an intuition. Let's say you want, I want take a chessboard and I want to prove to you that like, let's say the black player has a winning strategy. How do I give a classical proof of that? It seems like the way to do it to say, no matter what the white player does, Here's a player, here's a move. So that no matter what the white player does, here's a move. It's like an exponential tree. Now, with, uh, with an interactive proof, well, okay, here's a, here's a, this is not a proof, but just, I can play you. I can tell you I have one strategy. You're like, I don't believe you. Let's play. Well, just interact, I win. Now, that's not a proof that I have a winning strategy. That just proves I could be new. But one can kind of using techniques of error correcting code, make an interactive proof for any, for, for, for example, for proving chess and, and in more generally any piece space. So this is a very powerful uh, uh, 
model that we'll use to construct scenarios. Okay, today. I just want to mention a few more things that actually I won't need for the talk, but it seems like it's too beautiful not to mention. Uh, so after this, there was another work uh, by Bernard Goldasar, Kilian, and Avi. Uh, and they defined, again, they were interested in zero knowledge. Their goal was to get information theoretical zero knowledge. Here they got some computational version of it. Never mind. They were so motivated with zero knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they defined what's called the multi proof interactive. So here you have, let's say, two provers. You can have more, but think of two provers. Single verifier. He's still polynomial time. He still tosses coins. And he sends each of them a question. They give him an answer. And based on that, he decides if to accept or reject. And more, most importantly, these provers are not allowed to interact. So they can coordinate ahead of time, then they're put in different rooms, they're given a query they need to answer without talking to each other. Turns out this is extremely powerful. Whatever you can, you can do, you can prove any language that can be computed in non-deterministic exponential time with two provers. MIP is just short for multi-prover interactions. So like exponential computation. Wow. Okay. And, and after this, shortly after this, there was the observation that actually, because they're so small, like a, essentially the questions, that if you think about, let's say, NP, if, if you take the scaled down version of it, the communication becomes only log. Actually, you can have the prover kind of give all of its possible answers in a database. The second prover gives all his possible answers in the database. So you can think of the two kind of all possible answers of proof of one, all possible answers of proof of two, as one big kind of proof that actually the verifier can check by just reading two locations, like two blocks. Of, so you can now say, oh, that's weird. So what does it give you? It gives you a proof that you can just kind of verify by just reading randomly a few locations. Who would ever think of that as a, like, construct a proof this way? That's really amazing. And then there's been a lot of work. Actually, by now we know that we can take any proof and make it a little bigger, not too much bigger, okay? A little bigger that can be verified by reading three bits. Just randomly, you choose kind of three bits and you can use the probability, you know, seven, eight. And if you want more, you repeat. This is really, really, really unbelievable. So th this is kind of the evolution of proofs. There's more to it, and it's really an exciting field. But all of this work, the focus of it, this all works from the 90s, really, really beautiful works from the 90s. And the focus was kind of first on statistical summits, and also importantly, on very high complexity classes. So they thought of the provers all powerful. They don't care about the rest of the proof. He's like, is even it was called by work of Babai, they're called Arthur Merlin proof. Like the proof is a wizard. He's like a Merlin. He's like all powerful. So in these groups in the 90s, the prover, the prover was considered all powerful. And the goal was just to convince a bounded verifier. The verifier is polynomial. Okay? Questions about the history? Yes. I didn't quite get why the multi prover model is more powerful than the single prover model. What, what's it? Powerful? Good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is why? Yes. Yeah, the uh, multi prover model is much more powerful. And I'll give you an intuition why. Think of it. When you have, you want someone to prove to you something. When you have two provers that cannot interact, think of them as, as like two uh, suspects. So you're both told you cannot cheat, right? The problem is cheating. You want to prevent cheating. It's much easier to prevent two people that cannot interact from cheating than one. Like think of suspects. You know, if you have two, they need to cheat consistently and they're far away from each other. They, so that's the intuition for why it's much harder to cheat in this model and hence you can prove much more in this model. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, so in uh, 2008, together with uh, Goldwasser and Wolf Bloom, we, we kind of embarked on a different, related, but slightly different study, which is about doubly efficient interactive proofs. So our goal would say, you know, it's very nice that an all-powerful prover can prove these things, but we don't have all-powerful provers in the real world. So I want the prover to be, not all powerful, I want it to be relatively efficient. So if he proves a time t computation, I want the prover to run in time related to t, let's say poly t. Okay, and now what can we do? That, that was the question. Can we have this, what we call a doubly efficient interactive proof? And our focus is actually on p. We, we cared, we didn't, before it was like, the verifier is polynomial time. So any kind of poly time computation, there's nothing to prove. He can do it on his own. We were thinking, no, we have actually a real world 
you know, maybe the proof of can't, even if the computation is polynomial, let's say it takes time n to the 10th, but the verifier can run only in time n squared. Okay, so we were thinking of more real life uh, computation. And indeed, the goal was that the verifier will be super efficient, much more than the time uh, t that it takes to compute. And to generate a proof should incur minimal overhead. So let's say the proof should be computable in time at most poly t. And if you think of more, more practical things, you want actually linear NP or quasi linear NP. So that gives you a, a little bit of a similar flavor to the SNARD, uh, but it's we still here we were thinking of work, we were okay with interaction, we didn't care about non interactive solutions. We just want both the prover and the, the prover to be minimal overhead and the verifier should be super, super efficient. Okay, and we, and uh, even for, for polynomial time computation, it made sense. And actually, we were in our head, we were thinking about polynomial time computation. That was kind of the model that we cared about. But it, this is for arbitrary. Okay, and so what we did, we constructed this doubly efficient interactive proof for the class of bounded depth computation. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, and uh, so this protocol is known in the literature as the GCAP protocol, so I'll refer to it in this way uh, through the talk, throughout the talk. And then it turns out that the fact that it's interactive, actually we can use a well-known and very famous heuristic Called the future heuristic to make it non interactive and then to make it a snark. Okay, so I'm, I, I, I'm going to explain what uh, this uh, future heuristic is. It's a heuristic, so we don't know that it's prudently secure. And so this snark was also a heuristic. So I said, you know, we had heuristics, Keith and Mikhail did the first. This was another heuristic, but it was a heuristic. We had, didn't have the proof of security. And only recently, in the last like couple of years, finally we managed to prove security of this under standard assumptions, and I'll get to that, okay? But before we even proved security, what was nice about this SNARG as opposed to, let's say, the Kilian Mikali one, is that it was very, very efficient, okay? It turned out that it's, uh, even though we were three theorists working on it, and that wasn't our goal, actually, we just want double efficiency, but it was very simple. The, the proof itself was very, very simple. I'm gonna actually even show you how it works. It's simple enough to actually show, and so it was very efficient. Okay, so now that we have something that, our protocol stuff wasn't practical uh, as is, but it, it was efficient enough to, you know, that you can kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, make it practical. So kind of tune the parameters and so on, that would be practical. So that was kind of, so this kind of sprung out a lot of follow up protocols and there was tons, tons of work on, on snobs trying to get snobs and proof parameters. Actually, there have been also a lot of very, very beautiful theoretical ideas and a lot of implementation ideas. And it's, it's like, a, I, I'm giving you, really, this is really a subset, just thing that I found, uh, I'm sure there's a bunch more. These are kind of uh, prototypes, so implementations. Uh, these are, the yellow are based on SNAR, on GKR, but there's a lot of other ideas that, you know, other kind of techniques uh, uh, that were also implemented and prototyped. And not only that, it's, so it's kind of, it started from theory to practice, to kind of implementation, and then to deployment. So people, like a lot of, uh, for example, blockchain technologies are using it, uh, starting with kind of Zcash and software, which are people in our field, uh, you know, academics that started these startups, but today even Ethereum uses it. So it's very kind of, uh, uh, and I think more and more are using it. Uh, so, so it became a big, uh, you know, um, uh, really uh, a success story. And now there's also like the uh, DARPA, which is one of the biggest kind of security funding agencies in the United States. Now there's a huge kind of focus of them to try to get these snarls practical, like uh, efficient, like uh, secure, making sure because you know these things were deployed, but we have these are all heuristics, and we want to make sure that things are secure. Okay, so there's a big uh, uh, kind of a project here trying to not uh, make things secure, make things post quantum secure, and that was a big uh, worry. And also, of course, more and more efficient, more succinct, more efficient, and so on. Okay. But what I want to say, despite all this kind of excitement and you know um, all this implementation and deployment and uh, all this excitement, actually, until recently, we didn't have any proofs. It was all it was all heuristics. I mean, we had proofs in some ideal model, but that's not you know we're using it. We have no idea if it's secure, not secure. We don't know. Okay. So really. What uh, the goal is to get provable security, okay? Which again means that you cannot, actually I can prove that if you could fake a certificate, then I can use you to factor numbers, to bring the learning with error assumption or whatever assumption I'm, I'm relying on. Questions? 
Okay. Too slow, too fast, good? Good, okay. Uh, so here's what I wanna uh, tell you for the remaining of the talk. First, I wanna tell you a little bit about the GPL protocol. And then I wanna talk to you, show you how to get, use it to get a snark and uh, kind of challenges improving security and how we kind of, just a glimpse of how we got a lot of them. Uh, and what I don't want to, I, I, I want to, but I don't have time to tell you, but I just want to tell you that it exists. And who knows, maybe next time uh, I'll tell you about it. As you know, I mentioned this kind of evolution of proofs where I said there's also multi-program interactive proofs and PCP, publicly checkable proofs. We can actually convert publicly checkable proofs to SNARGs. And uh, that <clears throat> is a very kind of interesting line of work with a lot of connections to other areas of, of the theory. Uh, and it's very much related, this notion. So we should to convert a non-signaling PCP in the post of standard PCP. I'm not going to find what a non-signaling PCP is, but it's a notion from quantum physics and kind of the fact that it came 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 up here. I, there's no quantum, I, I'm not, I, I forget about the post-quantum security. Let's say don't care at all about post-quantum security. The fact that we still need kind of a quantum related uh, a kind of primitive here to get the slug was, very surprised. This connection that quantum came up here was, was very, very uh, surprising to us. Okay. So I just, before I dive into kind of the GKR protocol and how we make it into a snark, I just want to mention that this, is, as I mentioned already, this kind of journey of trying to construct snarks was not only, a, not only kind of we have good snarks today, which is very nice, but we learned a lot about things that have nothing to do with snarks on the way. Uh, about quantum is one of them, uh, hardness of approximation, hardness of finding natural equilibrium. I'm gonna actually mention this one as we go along. And also we had a lot of kind of applications to cryptography that we learned along the way. One of them that I'm gonna focus on today is the Fiat Chimino paradigm, the, 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 this heuristic that I'm gonna talk about. Okay. So, okay, so where are we? So, uh, you know, we said, I promise I'm gonna construct the snug. Let me do it. Okay, so now I'm, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna talk about the, the GKR protocol and how I convert it into a snug. So before I go to the GKR protocol, let me first start with a little bit about the Fiat Jimmy. So the GKR protocol is like, it's an interactive proof. Okay, with a, as I said, the proof, not too much overhead for the prover and the verifier is very efficient. Importantly, this protocol is what's called public coin. Public coin means that the verifier just sends random challenges. So the prover sends a message, the verifier sends a random challenge, just a random bit, essentially random, random bits. That's important. Why? Because Fiat and Shamir in the mid 80s, they came up with a beautiful, beautiful, elegant and simple heuristic to convert any public coin interactive proof into non-interactive. And here's their idea. It's really, it's so simple that it's, it's I, I'll explain it in one slide, and here's their idea. They say the following. Suppose you have an interactive protocol, let's call the messages alpha, beta, a gamma, uh, delta, and epsilon. Here's how, how I can convert it to a snark. Forget about interaction. The prover does not interact, interact with the verifier. He will send all the messages to the, now, the, so the prover sends. He said, here's alpha, here's beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. But then he can cheat if he chooses the question that the verifier, is that you are allowing him to choose the question that the verifier would have asked. So he'll choose the, uh, he'll choose the question that he can answer. So the, we lost some of this. So here's how we tie his hands. We tell him, you know, you can't, you're not free to choose beta and delta. You have, to, beta and delta are gonna be some hash of the transcript so far. So beta must be some hash of alpha. Delta must be some hash of alpha, beta, gamma. Now, what, when I say hash, what do I mean by hash? What is this notion? So think about it's some function, okay? And everybody agrees, that's kind of the CRS here, okay? We all agree on a function. Now, what is this function? It's something that looks random. It's like a random looking function. Now, what does it mean a random looking function? Well, so that was the problem. If this function was really, really random, like it was like a random oracle, that, that actually one can prove like this heuristic does not become heuristic anymore. It's actually sound. It's like what can prove soundness because interacting with a box with a, with a random box or interacting with a verifier, it's the same thing. But this is actually a function. It's not a random oracle. It's a function. It has been implemented. There's a code to this function that everybody knows. So now you replace the random verifier, 
as we said, the verifier's randomness, that's what gives the interactive proof the power that the verifier chooses randomness, that the, the verifier chooses randomness that the prover doesn't know ahead of time. But no, it's a fixed deterministic hash function. And again, when I say hash function, it's a function, okay? That's it. Uh, usually in cryptography, we use hash function. It's a loaded term, but you know, to think, oh, it's like, it's like random. But it's not. So that, that was, uh, if it was random, and people said, well, you know, our hash functions, ah, they look random, ah, you know. So that's the heuristic. So the heuristic is very simple, but the analysis of it is very problematic because it depends which hash function you use and exactly what property. We don't even can say, okay, if you have this property, like collision resistance, one way this, then it's secure. We don't have that. We, the only property we say if it's truly random, but that's not. It's like a false property. So, but, but that's the heuristic. Okay. Questions about this heuristic? Okay, so now I just want to mention, well, if I can convert any interactive proof to SNARG, then you can say, okay, why do I need uh, the GKR? We already had it. I told you already, we had interactive proofs from the 90s. We proved that IP equals P space. Why do I need the GKR protocol? Why can't I use one of the IPs, interactive proofs, convert it back? And the reason is that in this line of work, as I said, they, did this, they didn't care about the provers one time. And if you look and try to see how long does their prover run, actually it runs in time two to the space of the computation squared. So even for log space computations, like poly time log space, to prove, so these are even for polynomial time computation that only require log space, to prove it now you're running in more than polynomial, like in quasi polynomial time. Yeah, do you have yes. protocols for which you know that the feature heuristic doesn't work? Yes, I'm going to talk about that. So the question, let me just repeat it for the question was, do okay, we're not sure it works, but do we actually have examples where it doesn't work? And the answer is yes, and I'll mention that. Because I can imagine, for example, that if the questions of the verifier are very small, this is obviously ah, very easy. Okay, to, uh, okay. If you're right, so of course, okay. If you have like, if the verifier's uh, questions are, let's say one bit, and so you have many, many rounds if you want kind of a uh, very small probability of error, then we know that the future that breaks. Then we know yeah, that. Clearly, like clear. Clear. It's, uh, yeah, it's clear, because you can kind of rewind, you know, you'll just- uh, Numerate over like exactly. a few questions. Exactly. But even for constant, uh, so think of, you know, let's say constant round protocols. Is the future will always, may, maybe, do we have examples there? And yes. So I'm going to mention, we have, we have examples where the peer terminal doesn't, is, is, is insecure, even for constant round protocols, or, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the insecurity of the peer terminal paradigm a bit. Okay, thanks for the question. Any, any other questions? Okay, so because the classic contracted proofs, the, the, the prover runtime, there was a huge overhead, so that was kind of the motivation. Okay, so we have GKR with very little overhead. And, and then we apply GKR to the, we apply the feature mini heuristic to GKR and we get the same. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do is actually tell you a little bit about how the GKR protocol works. Okay. So the GKR protocol is for bound, as I said, it's for bounded depth computation. Let me tell you, what do I mean by bounded depth? I'm not gonna define it too formally, but think of it as like, uh, it's computed by some circuit and the circuit has layers and each layer there are some gates, addition, multiplication, whatever you want. And, and when I mean bounded depth, I mean the depth of the circuit, the number of layers is bounded by some quantity D, okay? And in our case, the SNAR, the size of the certificate and the time it takes to verify will grow with D. So it's only succeed if the depth is, is short. Okay, and I'm gonna show maybe if I have time at the end of the talk, how we get around this depth business. Okay, but for now it's for bounded depth. Think of it like polylog depth. Okay, so here's how I, how the GKR protocol works. Here's what the prover does. There's some circuit of bounded depth. There's the input and all the values about the, the y, the gates, okay? And the first thing the prover does, he computes the values of all the gates and he encodes for each layer, he encodes all the bits of, uh, you know, here are the axes, the inputs, and the values of the gates using some error correcting code. Okay, so I don't want to go into detail exactly. It's a low degree sending code, but that's not important. Like read Muller's code, but, um, but think of it as just an error correcting code. 
Okay, so he encodes like this all the layers. This he does before he even starts. It's in his head. Okay, so I'm uh, the prover. I compute all the uh, gates. I compute all the big, uh, like a code, coding, an uh, aircraft encoding of all the gates in each layer, layer by layer. And now we start. So I start, I tell you, look, the value of the output is one. That's my claim. You want to make sure that if I'm lying, you can, you can catch me. Here's how we, what we do. We're going to do a little tiny kind of reduction protocol. And this reduction protocol, in this reduction protocol, the verifier is going to cost coin. It's an interactive protocol. And at the end of this, we're going to have, we're going to agree on some value in, well, in the layer before, in the uh, uh, value in the encoding of the layer below. And this reduction protocol has the following guarantee. If I cheated and I gave a wrong bit in the output bit, then I must, with very high probability, the value VD minus one in, the, in layer D minus one will also be incorrect. So we do this reduction protocol and then we have the, the we do it again we, and we have the guarantee, well, if VD minus one was incorrect with high probability, the value in layer D minus two is incorrect. And we continue this reduction protocol D times, hence we pay with the get. And, and finally, we get, okay, so if this was incorrect, the high probability is going to be, you know, the, uh, I, I lose the probability much, much smaller than one over D, so I can do kind of a union bound and argue that if I was incorrect here, then when we go down there, I'm still going to be incorrect in the input layer. And this is the verified check, it's just an input layer. He just computes in linear and, you know, linear time, you can check a point in the extent, in the encoding. So he does that on his own. This is the protocol. And now I did mention what this reduction protocol is, but really what it is for anybody who, it's a very, the well-known subject protocol. It's really basically that's it. That's all we do. So I don't want to go into what this subject protocol is. It's a really beautiful protocol, but it's also a very simple protocol. Okay. So this is the high level of the, and this subject protocol is public form. So that protocol, the verifier only sends random points, and hence we can apply this fiat to the heuristic. Okay. So now the question, is it secure? I promised you a provably secure snark, and I said the future heuristic is not only really secure. So, or not, sorry, let me take it back. It's not clear that it's secure. And it's not clear when it's secure, it's not clear when it's insecure. Okay. So now what I want to do next, so first let me say, punchline, we can prove that it is secure under standard assumption for this specific protocol. We can prove that it's secure under the learning with error assumption, which is like our favorite post-quantum secure assumption. And we can prove that it's secure on what's called the DD8, the Diffie-Hellman, uh, decision Diffie-Hellman assumption. I don't want to go into it, but it's also kind of an assumption that we have from the, you know, more than 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> These are assumptions that will come through. Okay. <coughs> so now what I want to do next is to tell you a little bit about the Fiat Chamilla paradigm. So, or the Fiat Chamilla heuristic. So this heuristic was, as I said, proposed by the mid eighties. I was actually proposed not for general converting interactive proofs to uh, non-interactive ones. It was proposed for the very specific task of converting identification scheme into signature scheme. So an identification scheme is like an interactive protocol that you prove that you're, you're who you claim you are. So let's say you have a public key and you want to prove that you're the owner of the secret key. And then there's a way of converting this into kind of a non-interactive non signature scheme. So they propose it as a way to construct kind of very efficient signature schemes. And this is a really a super popular uh, heuristic because it's used all over the place. So one of the most widely used signature schemes called ECDSA uh, is based on this heuristic. So every time you use your iPhone, you use the ECDSA signature. All the blockchain technology uses the, uh, this signature, um, all the iOS devices, use, it's really used a lot, this uh, signature. <laughs> and it's based on the future of heuristic. So we better understand if this heuristic is sound or not. It's very, very important. Okay. So what's normal? In practice, it seems to work very well. We didn't have a single hack break that the way they broke is by breaking the future of heuristic. So that's wonderful. But then it begs the question, okay, but is it, so it must be secure. So let's prove it. You know, is that secure or is it secure? You know, it's not independent of Nazi, right? So we, not, we want to understand the scientists. Is it, do we, is it secure practice because we're not smart enough to break? 
or do we not have a proof yet because we're not smart enough to prove what we, you know where are we standing okay so actually I've, I, I've worked I was obsessed about this question for many years I was additional student uh, in Weizmann and I was really trying to prove this heuristic I felt like I have to prove this heuristic and then I moved to MIT and actually uh, with, uh, with Shafi who was in my advisor uh, we broke we actually came up with an example of a identification scheme that no matter which hash function you use, it doesn't matter. As long as you give me a description of hash function, I can show you how to break. Like you, it, it just breaks. Now, our identification scheme was very contrived. We didn't show that ECDSA is, not, is, is insecure. But essentially what we showed is there's no way one can prove this heuristic because there's counter examples. Moreover, Remember I mentioned the first construction by Kia and Mikali of SNARGs from the 90s? They also use this heuristic. They also rely on the fiat heuristic. And guess what? Recently, it was actually broken. So the result shows that, so they use components, they use inside hash functions, so once it was in the PCP. So one showed, well, if you used this hash function, use this PCP, and no, no matter which hash function you use for the fiat it will break. So again, kind of even, you know, for snarks, it's broken. So why is it not, and I, I just told you that for GKR, we managed to prove security. So what makes GKR different than Kia and Mikali or different than this counter example? So now we understand, okay, so we understand sometimes it's not secure. And this is kind of a natural one. It's not even a contrived one. So we want the kind of partition, you know, here, these are the insecure ones, these are secure ones. But I can't say, oh, this is a contract thing, the rest are fine. No, this is natural. So where, where are we? Where do we stand? So one thing that we noticed is that all of these counterexamples, like our counterexample and the counterexample for, uh, uh, for uh, Kilian Mikali, the initial protocol that you start with, so in Kilian Mikali, they start with a four-arm protocol and apply the fiat to meal. And in our case, we start with a three-round protocol applied to feature meal for this negative result. And both of them, the interactive protocol that we started with actually didn't have statistical soundness. Even their soundness was only computational. So these protocols, they started with a, with a protocol that had only computational soundness and then applied the feature meal to make it even more computational sound, like more assumptions that, okay? But they didn't start with a statistical sound protocol like GKR. So then it, it does the question, maybe this heuristic is secure when you apply to any statistical sound protocol. At least I'll try to pull security for statistical sound protocols. Okay. So uh, together with the Rothman brothers, uh, several years ago, we actually showed that it's secure. Any statistically sound protocol, we can, uh, a, when you apply fiat you'll get security, but under very, very strong assumptions. So I, I'm saying it's secure and kind of, I'm a little hesitant because the assumptions that were so strong that I'm not trying to believe that I believe that. So, but at least we showed, you know what, if, if you break this, then at least that assumption is broken, which is interesting, but it's not like, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna shake the world because it's a weird assumption, okay? Okay, so then we, we tried to get the assumption better we were able to make it under a really standard assumption. We didn't succeed. We still don't know. So this is still the best. Like, we don't know how to do it under a better assumption. There, there have been works who tried to improve the assumption, but they improved it in not, not the problematic part. There's this problematic part that there assumes kind of perfect security, and that part was not. Like, an assumption that assumes you can't do anything better than brute force. It's like, eh, why not? It was kind of a bit of an iffy assumption. But recently, what we showed is for the specific GKR protocol, Actually, we can do it under standard assumptions. So now in the rest of uh, the talk, what I want to show in the next 10 minutes is kind of a little bit of a glimpse of how we prove security here. So of course, I'm not going to show the proof. I just want to show like very uh, intuition, high level intuition. Okay. And then you'll see why like proof as opposed to computationally sound proof. Why is it important that we start with something with statistical soundness? Okay. So here's the idea. I don't argue you cannot cheat, okay? So how do I argue? So suppose, you know, you're trying to prove something that's false. Now, in the interactive setting, what does it mean that it has statistical soundness? It means no matter what the cheating prover sends alpha, no, for any alpha that he sends, 
there are only a few betas. So for red and beta, you cannot know. For red and beta, you will say. So there's only a few betas that there exists, like that there exists a gamma that will be accepted. So I'm gonna call the betas that kind of allow you to cheat as bad betas. So the fact that it's statistically sound says that every alpha has very few kind of bad betas that it will allow you to win. As a side remark note, if it's only computationally sound, every bit you can win, you can cheat. It's a, you just don't have the computational power to cheat. It becomes a computational argument. It's messy and we don't know how to deal with it. But in the statistical setting, it's very clean. It just says, look, every alpha, you should be able to cheat with it because it's sound. So there's very few betas that will allow you to cheat. There's very few bad betas. So here's the idea. When you apply the fiat to meal, all you need to do is to stay away from the bad betas, and there are very few of them. So why is it so hard? Let's just stay away from the bad betas. And the reason it's hard is because compute, given alpha, computing the set of bad betas is very difficult. So this, it's a very intensive computation. So I can't, here's, a, here's what, it, suppose there's only one bad beta, let's say. Here's an idea. H will compute the bad beta and will send bad beta plus one. Or what a flip a bit. No, it's not bad. Very nice, but how do I compute the bad beta? That's a very, uh, the half function can compute it because it's not efficient. So the problem is that we cannot compute these bad betas. That was, if we could compute it, we're done. Okay. So then the idea in, 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 uh, in this Kerr paper was to say, you know what? Let, here's the hash function I'm gonna use. In the hash function, at least in the analysis, so here comes a little crypto. So now you need to be very high level hash, okay? Because you, you won't be able to understand really, but, but the kind of idea. We, we construct a hash function. We, so what do we do? We construct a hash function that we can, with this hash function, you cannot cheat. So with this hash function, the fiat the fiat heuristic will be secure. And what do we do? In the, in the hash function, in the seed, in the kind of description of the hash function, we have, using cryptography, one pair alpha star and beta star. Alpha star will be completely random, and beta star will not be in the bell. You, beta star will be, will be a good one. So you cannot cheat with beta star. But you can cheat with any, I mean, so now what do we know? With alpha star, you cannot cheat. So, because, okay, sorry, in this hash function, so I have alpha star and beta star hidden here, and this hash function, I didn't put alpha star, we'll all put beta star. So the point is, on alpha star, you cannot cheat, because alpha star actually outputs a bad beta. And I didn't have to compute it, because I kind of hardwired it into the hash. So the hash, I took the hash the following. If you happen to get alpha star, I'll put beta star. And on that beta star, you cannot cheat. And everything else I can't hardwire all the uh, otherwise it would be exponential. So I just hired one, hardwired one pair, alpha star and beta star, and that alpha star, the guy cannot cheat. Now, of course, you can choose another alpha. He's not gonna choose alpha star. Actually, alpha star is one out of many. So the chance that he didn't choose this alpha star is very small. So it seems like, what is this game? We tell the hash function, and this specific alpha star, alpha beta star, and beta star is not in that. Okay, what, uh, like, uh, you won't cheat on alpha star, you'll cheat, you cheat on a different alpha. So the point is, now we want to say, because I'm going to hide alpha star and beta star so well, it's going to be hidden using encryption, or it's going to be kind of very well uh, hidden. Now we want to argue, actually, you cannot cheat with any alpha. Why? If he cheats with some alpha, now he knows that alpha is not alpha star. So he learned something about alpha star. And then it's going to break my crypto. That's the idea. But the reason it's, the assumption is so strong is because what am I saying? I'm saying, oh, he, I, I hit alpha star and he learned something about alpha star. But what did he learn? He got a very, very weak signal. There's exponentially many options. All, he didn't learn alpha star. He just learned it's not one alpha. Out of exponent, it's such a weak signal that to do an assumption out of it is a really, really strong assumption. Because if he learned this, we argue, oh, a cheating prover must learn alpha star. Wow, that will be kind of, I can convert that into standard assumption. But here all I learned, I hit alpha star, and I said a cheating prover can learn that it's not one of exponentially many options. Okay, it's a very, very, very weak signal that transforms itself to a very, very, very strong assumption. Uh, okay, yeah, so the reason if, if the idea is if you can choose with an alpha, then he breaks that. He knows it's not alpha star, so that's kind of okay. Yeah. Okay. However, for the GKR protocol, for this specific GKR protocol, it turns out, and I'm not going to say anything about why, I just that this bad set bad alpha, it's not, it can't be efficiently computable. But if you know 
or some trap or some secret information, eh, then it can be efficient computable. So if you if you kind of know some trap door and you can guess correctly the verified messages, I don't want to get into it, but if you know some information, all of a sudden it is efficiently computable. And then we kind of in the analysis hide this information and the trap door pop up and make it and then, and then get a much smaller, stronger signal. So the way I, the, I guess the take-home message that I want that I want to convey here. The hard part that bad, computing bad is hard, if computing bad was easy, we are good. And in GKR, it turns out the computing bad is easy in some trap door if you know some information and this information will kind of hide using cryptography and we can deal with it. So that's all I wanted to say about, uh, about the analysis. I didn't want to say too much about it. Actually, the analysis here is very, very complex. So, uh, but here are the takeaways that I wanted to, uh, uh, kind of to leave you with. Uh, so what did we learn from, from this talk? So first we have a doubly efficient interactive case. Okay, so now we have a, a proof for, for bounded depth computation uh, that the prover is very, very efficient. Uh, the verifier is efficient, assuming the depth is small. Uh, and okay. Second, we can convert it into a snarb using the future heuristic under provably, uh, with provable security under standard assumptions. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we did that in two different works. <laughs> Uh, and there are many implementations and deployment of, uh, of, of these nodes. And we got several bonuses from this specific kind of route that we took. So first, we got a deeper understanding of the future mill heuristic, which, as I said, is much more interesting than actually the snobs. It's something we use, all of us use every single day when we sign messages. So this is a very important heuristic. And kind of out of the way, we gained a much better understanding of the security of this heuristic. The other bonus that we got is we got applications, surprising applications to complexity theory. So one example of this is we, what we showed using exactly these works is that finding, it's very hard to find a Nash equilibrium. Now, it should be, but what is the connection between SNARGs and Nash equilibrium? So what we showed is finding a Nash equilibrium is hard assuming our SNARG is secure. So I'm assuming that this LWR assumption or DDH assumption. That's bizarre. So let me tell you a little bit why. So there's prior work that shows that if you have snarks that have uniqueness properties, so a snark, not only you can't, even for honestly, even for, for honest compute, for true computation, you can only generate one snark. You can't generate two different snarks. It's like unique. And it also it has this some updatability property, which I didn't talk to you about. Uh, then you can embed this in uh, in kind of as a what's called a PPAD problem. PPAD is a complexity class. I don't want to go into it, but what I do want to say is Nash is known to be PPAD complete. So people were interested in computing Nash equilibrium, whether it's easy or hard, and it motivated a definition of a complexity class called PPAD. Okay, so PPAD, the motivation for it is to know whether Nash equilibrium is hard or not. And because we can, we can embed the snark in this PPAD, it shows that kind of this language is hard because if time t, if t is very, very large, it's very hard to know if you know, there exists a succinct, if, if, if uh, it's true or not true. And we, embed, we put that as a PPAD problem somehow. And so because that's hard, it means Nash is hard because Nash is complete. It's the hardest one. So I, I, I'm definitely not going to tell you anything about how, uh, you know, the, how, how to embed the snark into PPAD, because I'm not going to define what PPAD is, nor am I going to define what updatable uh, snarks are. But the GKR snarks can be, are, can be, actually, we can show that they're unique and updatable. Okay, so, okay, I, I don't have time, so I'm not going to tell you how to go beyond the bound of depth, but there's a way to take, if I said it's only good for, for shallow circuits, because we, we pay the, the size of the snark grows with the depth. What if we have a very deep circuit? So essentially what you do, you squash it. So what you do, you kind of, instead of taking this very deep circuit, you take the input to be all the wires, the values of all the wires, and you consider the circuit that just checks consistency, checks that all the wires kind of are consistent. And this consistency checker is much more, it's much shallower, and hence you'll do your care of that. So, okay, I, let me skip this. Um, and just end because we're on time. So I guess what I would say this kind of this this is kind of a subfield of cryptography. This snark, and it was 
I think of it as a very successful kind of story where it was really fun kind of collaboration between people that do complete theory like myself, people do implementation, people that actually deploy these things like bankers and, and so on. So it's been like a very nice success story. We have now a, this initiative called ZK Proof where we're trying to standardize this. And this is very kind of interesting collaboration again between us theorists, apply people, and people who use it, like the actual bankers that are using this thing, kind of telling us what, you know, asking how they should use it, and we, us understanding kind of what they need, what they care about. So it's kind of a nice, um, uh, I know, devolved into nice things. And I just want uh, to mention my amazing, amazing set of collaborators that I worked with in all these uh, problems. So on the top are uh, the amazing students I've worked with and my interns and postdocs, and finally my fantastic uh, uh, colleagues. Okay, uh, oh, let me just end with one grand challenge that we still can't do, and it's really making me not sleep at night. I am obsessed with this problem, is I showed constructing snarks for computation. Like you have a type D computation, you want to generate a certificate. What we really want also, in addition, is snarks for NP. What do I mean? Take a non-deterministic computation. Take like, there's a proof. I'm going to take a proof, like a, a, a classical proof, and shrink it using cryptography. I'm going to take a proof, use crypto to make the proof much, much shorter. So I can put it easily in, let's say, a blockchain, or can we do that? We have heuristics, but can we do that with a proof of security? Still, a, not, not, we don't have a provably secure uh, snaps for this. OK, thank you. Actually, <clears throat> what exactly is the statement that like which class of problems can you do probably secure snarks for now? Yeah, and yeah, 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 good. So we have probably secure snarks, understand, let's say learning with error is just an example. Uh, under, we have it for all deterministic computations. We even have it for subclasses of non-deterministic computations, like we have uh, bounded space non-deterministic Turing machines. So we have, we have some, we have a bunch of, like this is an example of a large computation. We have it, for example, this is something we're writing up right now, uh, but it's gonna be out soon for, let's say here's another NP, another non-deterministic class where it's monotone batch NP. Oh, we have it like for batch NP. What does it mean batch NP? Let's say I wanna to prove to you that, you know, this has a witness, a proof, and this has a proof, and, 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 and I wanna pay size of just one proof as opposed to all the proofs. We can do that. We can, we can do it not only with N, any monoton circuit apply. So I have a bunch of proofs or not, or I don't, I have a bunch of statements. Some of them are true, have a proof, some don't have a proof. And I want, I want to do the arbitrary kind of monoton circuit on them. So it can be a big N, the batch is one example, but any monoton circuit on them holds. I have a snark under provable security, like under, but I don't have one for all of NP. So say for, what are you talking about, like things in uh, deterministic yes, time? Yes, What is the size of the snags you're getting and what is the verification? <laughs> yeah, so the size is, the, okay, so I didn't get into these hairy details, but there's like a security parameter. And the security parameter tells you kind of how hard it is to forge. So usually if I have security parameter lambda bit, it means it's hard to forge with like, we believe that you can, if you like, you can forge with probably, I don't know, two to the minus lambda, something like that. And so our proofs depend on this lambda. And the security parameter. So it, I, I can't tell you a number because it depends how how um, strong how secure yeah, you want it to be, how paranoid you are. Polylog. Okay. Polylog. Yeah. Polylog. It depends on his polylog. And the verification time is linear. So the no, no almost no 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 it's linear in the input of course because you need to read the input. Yes. Okay. But yes. polylogarithmic in T and and in the yeah and actually if you have like a access to aircraft encode of the input, then you can run, you don't, you just run in polylog and t time and security parameter and you just access the, you know, the point, the input in one point and that's it. So you don't even need to be linear in the input if you have some, if it's encoded in some way for you, uh, which is, it's, it's natural in cases where you have one input stuck somewhere and you do many, many computations on that input. So you encode it once and then every time you want to verify something on it, you just access your encoding. Any any other questions? 
Okay, I hope I, maybe I can I, I manage to convert some of you. If anybody that wants to, you know, help me get out of my misery with the, you know, these questions that I can't solve, I, I would love to help. So okay. hopefully you converted them to snarks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank uh, you. Thank the speaker.